Um, this is a question. This is a question for two of you, but I want to start with Seth. Um, some, I think, last year I wrote a book uh, by Philip Yancey, um, um, a Princeton professor, and the title of the book was "Look, Mom, a White or a Black," and he tells the story of being out in public, and a little boy, white boy, was with his mom, and he, uh, the little boy, said, "Look, Mom, a black." And he said, loaded with, with that word, look, mom, a black was, look, mom, a criminal. She grabbed him and, mm -hmm. and um, uh, look, mom, a thief, a rapist. Uh, and Yancey's point was that children are being instilled to, to hate blacks and to fear blacks. And uh, uh, he actually said that, you know, blacks have the right to, when every time uh, we see a white person to say, look, uh, someone who has enslaved us, lynched mm -hmm. us, um, and we don't do that. Why do you think white people, uh, not all, uh, but some, uh, begin to plant seeds of fear with respect to African Americans and people of color? I think uh, because these systems perpetuate themselves over time. And, that's, and, and you've identified how they perpetuate themselves, that we pass that on in generation to generation. This is, you know, the sins of the father being passed on to the son for ten generations. That's what the biblical passage is talking mm -hmm. about. Um, and that, so we're passing on that woundedness. Compassion is what we use to bring attention to the fact that we're wounded and how to tend to that um, so that um, my sister told me a story. I don't, I'm too young to remember it. Um, but we were visiting relatives in Indiana, and apparently there was an African-American ama man walking across the street, and I said to my parents, is that Mr. T? Because uh, that was, I guess, my only connection to blackness at, at, at that such a young age. And I have no memory of this, but my sister remembers thinking that my parents were really uncomfortable about that. Mm -hmm. And so we, we start passing on this at very, very young age, and children are able to take that in at a very young age. Mm -hmm. And so it's taking the time to begin teaching our children differently, reforming our youth groups to be places where we explore this so that youth can address this. And then as adults saying, owning up to that and saying, you know what, I, I've been wounded too. I, ne I need to heal from this. I don't want to be a part of this cycle anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so taking time to practice compassion with ourselves so that we can begin to surface these wounds and then hold them and heal them. I believe it, it requires this shift, building upon what Seth just said, from thinking about racism as um, moving from being uh, not telling you don't want to be prejudiced to being anti-racist. Mm -hmm. That's very different. It's, it seems so subtle, but it's actually not. It, um, we're taught to not be prejudiced. We're taught to, to literally to not say out loud look a black, mm -hmm. but you just grab your mother's hand when you see a black person and you say it without saying it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we're taught that, okay, maybe you, sh you shouldn't do that. That's prejudice. Shifting to anti-racist is where I think, you know, critical race theory, racial formation theory is helpful because what you understand is that structurally, America is set up in a, in a racialized way, mm -hmm. you know? Such that you, that, that, that prejudice is, 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 is it's built into the system. And so we don't have to look for racism, we just have to look and observe the racism. And so we need to be anti-racist. We need to recognize that racism is embedded in these structures, right? So we need to, we need to look for how it's operating. And without, we don't need to assume that a system is neutral. You should assume that actually it's racist. Yeah. And we need to figure out how we can be anti-racist and unpack that, right? This is where I think Christianity is essential right, essential to dealing with it in America, this is a theological problem. Imagine if white church, white parishioners, white clergy took this seriously and began to do their own work and talked about this, right? Taking the risk of faith to be actually committed to the gospel. Because they're gonna say, most of them say, well, I have to worry about my parishioners, this isn't relative, this isn't important to my own congregation. And I will push back and say, well, no, this is deeply relevant to your congregation because they get the privilege of whiteness such that it allows the sin of racism to be perpetuated, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It is the most important thing you can talk about within your congregation. And so this is where I think yes. 
pastors doing this kind of work, engaging their own anti-racist praxis, right, doing that kind of work to unpack the ways in which they uh, benefit from it, and then teaching, working on it, making an explicit part of their church mission statement. That's to be the entirety of it. You have other things you need to do, but a part of it needs to be anti-racist work. Then you have to ask yourself, when you do your annual planning, how are we going to live out this part of our mission? If that happens, we can begin to see the kind of long-term transformation we need. But clergy have to take it seriously, have to see it as a theological problem, mm-hmm. right? And, and, when, and when we get there, we can begin to see some difference in America. Um, and un- unless and until we get there, it's going um, to continue to be an uphill battle, mm-hmm. but a battle we're fighting for.